to do this with both of you. Uh, so for our Essay Voices listeners, uh, we're doing our crossover today with Student Affairs Now, which is a video-based podcast, or I guess it'd be a vlogcast, something like that. Um, and I'm just really thrilled to be spending time today with Susanna and Glenn. Um, and so we're going to be talking a little bit about how uh, podcasting has been our professional uh, development environment of choice and a little bit about what that means for us and the field. And we're going to kind of meander along the way and kind of play around with a trio of hosts just uh, talking shop, I guess. I think that's a good way of putting it. Hello, everyone. Um, I guess we can do it. I mean, at least introduce myself. I'm, my name is Glenn de Guzman. Um, I use he, him pronouns. And I do want to acknowledge that I am coming from Livermore, California, which is the ancestral homeland of the Ohlone people. So hi, everyone in NASPA. Hey, NASPA, this is Susana Munoz, and I am coming to you from the original ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Ute, and Arapaho people. And I am, um, I also use she, her, her, a, a pronouns. And I am at Colorado State as a, professor of higher education leadership. Go Rams. What's up? Go, Go Rams. Rams. Yeah. And I've attended there, many, many graduations in um, in your uh, stadium over there, Susanna. A couple of friends have come out of master's programs up there. Oh, nice. It's lovely. It is. <laughs> But for, uh, for the uh, Student Affairs Now folks, hi, nice to meet you. I'm Dr. Jill Creighton. I use she, hers pronouns. Uh, working at Washington State University for my full-time gig uh, as Associate Vice President of Student Affairs and Dean of Students, coming up on just about two years here. Uh, I've been hosting the NASPA podcast for the last two seasons, and we are hoping to get at least two more seasons out to folks. Uh, we are coming to you from the ancestral homelands of the Nanipu people and the ceded lands of the Nez Perce tribe here on the Palouse uh, in Eastern Washington. Go Cougars! We say Cougs, go Cougs! Go Cougs. Yeah, my Cougs shirt on today too. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and just for everyone else to know, Student Affairs Now is for us, it's, uh, it's our podcast and it's our learning um, community for those who work in alongside or adjacent to the field of higher ed um, and student affairs. And really our mission is to just have good conversation. And we're just really trying to make a contribution to the field of student affairs and, and really just restore it to the profession. So um, I know this is a special edition episode. So we normally drop our episodes on Wednesdays, but this one we're gonna drop simultaneously with you, Jill. So I'm excited about that. Well, and for our Essay Voices listeners, if you'd like us to see, uh, or if you'd like to see us make faces at each other and things like that, you can actually catch this on YouTube rather than in your audio feed. Uh, so whatever brings you the most joy. I know a lot of you listen while you're driving, so please don't watch it while you're driving. Uh, but if you have some space uh, at your desk to catch it, hopefully um, you get at least some entertainment uh, or usefulness out of today. Very cool. Yeah, so this podcast gig is something I think that um, just like no one says I'm going to grow up being a student affairs professional, no one grows up saying I'm going to host a podcast. Uh, that's not part of uh, part of our upbringing usually. So how did you two find yourself wanting to lead in this space? Goodness. That's, I mean, I think, like you said, you know, it's sort of like these accidental um, happinesses that happen. <laughs> and and so getting asked by Keith and Heather and Glenn, who, I, by the way, um, I went to graduate school with, and, and I thought, oh, this is such a fun way to just kind of hang out and kind of rekindle some of the friendships that we had. But for me, I've, I'm a big fan of the podcast. And, and like I take, it's, I know, it drives my kids nuts because, you know, in the car, it's like, are we listening to a podcast or are we listening to music? I was like, no, we're, let's listen to, you know, podcasts, you know, um, one of the, my favorite ones are is, um, Latino Voices by Mari, um, Maria Hinojosa. Um, and so I, it's, it's been part of my repertoire. And so I think the decision that I made is that, you know, this, this is actually a really good learning tool. Um, because not only do I have conversations with my kids, you know, after we listen to a podcast, but it sort of it sparks sort of more dialogue afterwards, um, you know, later in the weeks and, and we continue to talk about it. And I thought, you know, wouldn't it be great to just sort of produce some content that I could, you know, bring into my own professional world. Um, but as a person who 
advises uh, doctoral students and um, is program director of a doctoral program, I'm also always thinking about like, you know, what is it that we we need now? What are what are some of the topics and contents that I think uh, will resonate with some of the things that we're experiencing on our campuses today? Yeah, you know, for me personally, you know, I've been in this field now for a little bit over twenty five years, and I remember. For me, what I appreciated so much about just our field in general was the connectivity between people and learning from each other. And, you know, I really take pride in, in um, mentoring in part because I received great mentoring as a young professional. And so I wanted to always um, do that and to be able to connect people to people who know more about stuff than me was always just sort of like a, a wonderful thing to do. And I think just the introduction of podcasts almost takes that model and just expands it exponentially. Because all of a sudden now, we have this connectivity to all these wonderful experts everywhere and people willing to put information on and taking the time to put information on um, this, this medium. I think that's what's so fascinating and, and, and amazing. I know that um, just talking to people, even when, we do when I do production, and just asking people, what podcast do you listen to? I start jotting down stuff like, oh, that's kind of cool. And so I'm starting to hear, and you know, I, I, I'll try some podcasts, some podcasts, I'm like, oh, that's okay. But then there are other ones that are just go-tos for me. And I just, I just can't wait for the next episode to drop. So I think that's kind of how I got involved in this as well, because it's given me a chance to pick topics and issues um, that are important to me, um, that I think is important to the, to the profession. And I always think about it from the sense of, how will this information be helpful for the for um, our next generation of student affairs practitioners and scholars and whatnot? So that's always how kind of I approach just even this podcast and, and why I'm involved with it. But yeah, I'm definitely excited to be doing this, especially with with Susanna and, and Keith and Heather, because yeah, we go way back. Yeah, when I first met Keith, uh, he was saying, yeah, we've just were a collection of old buddies from uh, you know, our younger days as professionals. And I think that's one of the things I love about the student affairs profession just generally is there are generational uh, components to it, including mentorship, right? We all, you both mentioned mentors and the, the reality is, you know, I think there are family trees of mentorship within the profession. So it's kind of fun to see how those things play out over time as folks grow in roles or, you know, come and go from the profession. Yeah, for sure. It, it does kind of make me old sometimes when I go back to like my conferences at NASPA, it's like, oh my gosh, you know, my um, RA is now like a VPSA and <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what happened? <laughs> like, I'm not that old, right? Oh, goodness. But I think like both of you, I'm a bit of an ascribed podcast junkie. Like my feed probably has over a hundred subscribed podcasts, everything from television shows that I enjoy and want to go back in and, and hear commentary on to, uh, I'm trying to brush up on some French language right now. There's some news things, uh, just like many folks these days, I have a couple of true crime things on there, a couple of work things. Um, but right now I'm really into the history of Ireland because um, I just finished watching Dairy Girls on Netflix. So I, the podcast medium brings so much to, uh, to me as a human being. And that's kind of what drives me to contribute into the field in this way. Uh, I often think about it as probably one of the most intimate mediums that you can have a dialogue with someone through. Because uh, when we watch television or, you know, even internet videos, I think a lot of us are, you know, we're looking at the phone or, you know, looking at a TV screen with our phone in between our face and that TV screen. Uh, but when you're doing a podcast, it's in someone's ears and it's, it's literally passing through, uh, you know, the six to eight inches of brain space um, and it's absorbed differently, it's experienced differently. Um, and so I've always found that really fascinating and a little bit intimidating with the archaeology of the podcasts, meaning that we're, we're leaving these digital footprints of this era of the profession. Um, and our profession is really good at changing with equity and social justice evolving, with practices changing, with generations turning. And so sometimes it makes me a little nervous that what we're dropping isn't going to age well uh, in the long run, but we try to. So how do you all kind of combat through that when you're, when you're thinking about some of those pieces? Hmm. That's great. Right? That's, a, yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, I, you know, it, it made me think about my dissertation. 
because you know that that's like uh, something that I wrote you know about ten years ago, and I'm such a different scholar than I I was back then, and so I think you know it, at times we we have to think of, as ourselves as always sort of evolving you know, in this process as we're kind of producing this content and knowledge. And, um, and so I'm, I'm always, you know, it, it to, to the point where I was like, oh, the, yeah, you can read my dissertation, but it's not necessarily what I believe in now, right? You know, it's like, I've kind of evolved. I kind of learned some new things. I'm challenged in these new ways. And so I think like the podcast, I kind of feel like, you know, um, tw you know, 10 years from now, you know, the content that we produced today and yesterday, I think we're going to, you know, ask ourselves, you know, like uh, the, you know, what, what kind of, you know, evolving have we done on ourselves? And that's part of the beauty of this process is that I think we can sort of document sort of that growth, but also um, there's going to be things that I think is going to really influence the way that we look at some of these really important societal issues. Um, in different and new ways than we are today. And so I think the more that we sort of model for folks that, you know, we're, we're also evolving and learning in this process, you know, and that's sort of what we invite you all to do is listen to us, but understand that some of the, you know, material and the things that we produce is, it, it may look different from any, um, the incoming generation, you know, from 10 years from now. So that's kind of how I look at it don't read my dissertation by the way <laughs> now i want to read your dissertation <laughs> you know i'm gonna do next episode I'm gonna, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a podcast um <laughs> for me you know it's interesting because i think that the the podcast that we're dropping today just helps build a knowledge base for the next generation to take it and take it to the next stage and i'll give you an example because this was you know um, I think about my early formative years when I was a, a you know, younger professional, and I remember when multicultural competency dropped, right, the, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. model that came out, um, Amy Reynolds, uh, Rochelle Pope, and uh, um, uh, uh, Reynolds, and, and uh, uh, Mueller, and I remember, mm -hmm. I remember thinking to myself, this is amazing, but over time, I know that people have started to interpret that model as sort of like aged, older, does it include everyone? And I remember listening to a podcast maybe a few months ago where they got to come on and really redefine multicultural competency and, and really kind of expand its understanding and how it can and how it can evolve over time. And I found that amazing. I think that's exactly what you know um, the next generation can can gain from is that model still has relevancy and we can continue to use it. Um, but we just have to continue to build because as we know, things change, things are evolving and, and we need, you know, you know we're a, we, need to, we need to adapt and we need to make sure that we're taking this knowledge and then, and then how do we apply it into today's setting. So I think that the podcast mm -hmm. is a great way to just really, um, again, build off of and, and grow from. It's an interesting way to lead because the space is so breathing um, and it's an interesting way to kind of uh, be able to select uh, in some ways and curate the voices of the field. That's what we do uh, for the NASA side. And I think it's a tremendous responsibility to really think about whose voice is being highlighted for what topic, for when, and really thinking about the equity perspective on guests, but also the, the balance of are we only putting out VPSAs? Are we only uh, featuring directors? And one of the goals for us is uh, really broadening the voice because, you know, if innovation is going to continue to happen. We have to integrate the perspectives of uh, professionals at all levels of the field. Otherwise, we're going to be stagnant and be behind the next generation of students that's coming in. I always think that, you know, our um, entry level professionals are the ones that have the best handle on what the student experience is currently like. And the older we get, the, le the more we are removed from that experience. Uh, so how do you how do you decide? Um, who you feature? I'll go. This go is ahead. A, yeah. This is an. That's a great question, and I'll tell you. So Susana and Keith, Heather, and I, we get together pretty much weekly, and we have this meeting where we do discuss topics, and we do discuss guests, and we do discuss who is who is in the who the panelists um, are in terms of um, their backgrounds, their lived experiences, the the lens they would bring. That's really important to us, um, and I think that we look. 
Um, oftentimes we, we do think about um, positionality and the roles that they play, but we also are really mindful to making sure that other voices are heard because to your point, um, Jill, uh, the next generation are coming in some really interesting and novel perspectives and thoughts. And to me, I feel like I'm getting a lot of learning when I'm hearing those voices because it allows me to think about what I sort of like learn and have ingrained in my style. And when I hear different ideas and thoughts, I'm thinking, that's pretty cool. Is that feasible? Can we do that? Can we look into that? Can we, can we start to explore those type of ideas? So, so for me, if we do not include those diverse perspectives, I think we're, we're, um, we're hurting ourselves as a profession, quite frankly. We need to make sure that we're hearing these new voices because sometimes it's very difficult to, to talk about being innovative in a workspace. But when you have a podcast or you have a, a different medium where you can just let go and be you and be authentic and share your voice, all of a sudden we're starting to hear some really interesting perspectives that, 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 that have something to it and we should explore it because quite frankly, they're the next generation of leaders. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I would also just add like, um, and this is the conversation we have, you know, within student affairs now is, you know, context matters in terms of are we, are we being inclusive of folks at community colleges? Are we being inclusive of folks that are at HBCUs and HSIs and MSIs? And, um, you know, so I think what, what I appreciate about sort of like the group that we have too, is that we're always holding, holding that mirror up for us to kind of see, okay, you know, how, how do we sort of, in, you know, interrogate sort of context too, in terms of the environmental um, areas that people are also bringing in, in terms of the, the knowledge in, in inclusive of their own sort of social identities and voices, but also sort of what the context is are, I think really matters in this, in this, um, in these conversations as well. Uh, and I think it's important to note for uh, anyone watching or listening, the context for us today is we're recording on January 7th, 2021, um, which is actually December 37th, 2020, apparently, uh, around all the things that have been happening um, in uh, in our environment right now. So with us all being US-based, you know, we're managing through supporting team members, processing uh, our own thoughts and feelings on the situations that are unfolding. and. Um, you know, I don't know about you two, but my uh, newsfeed buzzes are pretty intense today. Every every 15 minutes or so, it seems like a new headline's popping up. Uh, so we're balancing mm -hmm. being human alongside uh, the conversation that we get to have with each other. Thanks for acknowledging that, Jill, because yeah, I think that was one of the things that Susan and I were talking about even before the, the podcast. This is, this is a hard time for a lot of folks. And I know that, you know, I've had to put my game face on, which is very hard because, you know, um, you know, I work at an institution and we're responding, right? We have to respond and make sure we're supporting our students. And, um, and I think that's very real. And, you know, the interesting crazy thing is um, yesterday I, I, I did a, a recording, a podcast recording, and, it, and that topic emerged in our conversation. And so, again, going back to even your earlier question, that is now captured in a podcast that's going to be archived and it's going to be, it's there. And so some of even the the topic that we discussed was informed by what happened in, at the U.S. Capitol. So again, the, the value of podcasts allows us to get to really interesting topics, the complexity of the topics and how it continues to evolve just by daily events, right? And so, yeah. That's, I feel like that's in all of COVID, right? So right. We, we record, what are the current practices on COVID-19 <laughs> and leading through the pandemic? Well, that's not relevant in three weeks. <laughs> Sometimes we yeah. hope it is, but you know, the reality is I, I keep telling folks, uh, we've been in the pandemic now for like eight or nine months as far nine. as the United States is concerned. And we still have eight or nine months to go until students move in for the fall of 21. And I hear uh, so much anxiety around planning the right moves for fall of 21. And I think it's really critical that we all step back and go, wait, we have the same distance to go as far as we've come. And mm -hmm. that means that everything that we choose to do um, will probably need to change based on evolution of virus, vaccines, federal, local guidance, you name it, and even you know local context. So it's just it's a fascinating time to try to bring um, relevant professional development to 
to the profession when, when it shifts every five minutes. Yeah. I, and I, I think what I, what I would add is that I hope that we learn from this, right? Absolutely. And that we take time to just reflect upon what we've endured. And um, I always think that what we am, have endured is embodied in us. Right, and that we're going to carry this. Our students are, are going to carry this. Our staff, our faculty are carrying this. And sort of just because you know we have a vaccine and we're able to come back to campus doesn't mean that we don't still feel those effects. And so I'm, um, I, I get so disappointed when I hear about like we just want to get back to normal, get back to where we were. It's like I actually don't want to go back to where we were because. I think there's so much that I see that um, has happened in terms of the inequities that we see, the you know disparities of resources that I see. It's like we we need to do better. Our profession needs to do better, and so I think those are the. I hope that we take time to just understand like you know the impacts of this, but also like how do we even change and shift our practices in student affairs as a result of what we learned in this these nine months. I think that's super important. And I hope that doesn't go by the wayside at all. So I'm curious, because you're a researcher, Susana, you know, mm -hmm. what do you make of all of the things that are uh, being studied now? How do they how are they shifting, um, especially given that research takes time, right? You know, the study that you yeah. started in 2019 might be coming to form now. Um, versus the things that we're studying about the pandemic may not be available for another two years or so. Uh, so how do you frame an, a research agenda uh, when you don't really know how uh, to keep it relevant sometimes? Well, I think it, it, even in my research, this has come up sort of like, you know, um, my research is around sort of, um, you know, supporting institutional support of undocumented and DACA students, you know, um, and so, you know, COVID has definitely come up, but it's, there's no face-to-face, -face, you know, um, interviews that I've been doing. Um, and I, I have to say, I've been seeing, you know, with my students, even how they're collecting data, you know, having to even shift a little bit of the design and in, in, in the sense of like, okay, we probably need to take some of these observations out in the sense that, you know, there's, there's, you can't be on campus um, to observe, um, you know, how can we shift the, that design? But, um, but I will say that the, the, there is a tension in me about conducting research during this time because so many people have lost their jobs, have, have lost family members, are grieving, are in, in just such a really bad place in terms of, um, know their livelihood and so to to be asked to sort of continue sort of on the research and continue on this trajectory of productivity um, really speaks to sort of the the sort of academic capitalism that we live in, in within our higher education institutions you know and I know that our in, in my institution in particular where we have we're given in our annual evaluations 500 words to talk about the impacts of COVID on our research, you know. And I think I, I kind of push back on that in terms of like because it's positioned in binary ways and negative and positives. And so, um, and we're not talking about the other pandemic with this, which is racism, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and I was impacted by COVID, but I was impacted by the pandemic of racism. And um, that's not a sort of an intersectional conversation that we're having in, in how we're trying to navigate our research agendas. And so I just basically said, I don't you know, 500 words doesn't really begin to um, address sort of like the rage I feel <laughs> about what we're experiencing, you know? So I don't think um, people are ready for that, but, um, but it is different, I will say. And I, I see it so much in, our, in the students that I work with, our doctoral students. And, I see not only the fatigue, I don't know, see it in, in sort of like, yes, having to, to finish a doctoral program while, during a pandemic and during all these other things. And um, we're trying to be as humanizing as supportive as possible um, during this time, but it is, 
it is hard. It's hard. Yeah. There are so many layers in uh, what you were just describing. And I think one of the things that really, um, really has stuck, struck me uh, is the reframing of systemic racism as the concurrent pandemic, uh, which is a conversation I think we all need to be having. I thought it was um, sadly refreshing, I think, to hear Vice President-elect Harris uh, give a news conference this afternoon and really just name it, name mm -hmm. what's happening in society. And I think that's really new for us right now uh, to be able to, to just say, no, here's the disparate treatment that you can see with your, um, with your own experiences from summer of 2020 to winter of 2021. These things are here, they're real, they are impactful. And the process of denying those experiences also deny BIPOC the agency to describe our own experiences um, or to be believed that we have them. And I think that's probably the most traumatic part uh, for me anyway, just as a human being is this consistent space of just um, having to make a spectacle of one's pain in order to be taken, not even seriously, just to be heard. Uh, so it's such a fascinating uh, space to be in while we are also leading in much larger spaces. Uh, so I'm just mm -hmm. kind of curious if you all want to riff on that a little bit in terms of how you navigate your own space um, while also holding space for people you supervise and for the students that have uh, so much more complexity around them that's talked about than, than we were even 10 years ago. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll comment on that really quick. I think that's, um, you hit it right on the, on the nose. We have to name it. We have to name these experiences and we need to acknowledge that every, every student or every professional, even student first professional or every faculty are going through this, this, this past year in a different way. Um, certain things are hitting people in, in, um, and impacting people um, differently. Um, I know I think about like this past year and um, I think about health. I think about my, my family's health because that is the most resonant thing and the top of my list. And, and I do care about what's happening nationally. I do care what's happening every, everywhere else, but I have to almost compartmentalize if I'm able to sustain myself and be an effective professional. So I think that's one thing that's really important. When I think about my professional side, I have to name it for the students as well, right? You know, when an incident occurs, I think it's critical that we get in front of it and we acknowledge it, we talk about it, we, 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 we establish our stance on it and, and, and be courageous and, and name it. Because if we are representing um, our university or our college, if we're representing what we value, we need, we need to, as leaders, name it. I think that's one of the, the things, you know, in, in connecting it back to even just our, this, this thing about uh, podcasts is that that's what I so have enjoyed when I'm listening to um, particularly student affairs professionals who, who do their own podcasts. Some have gone on for many, many episodes. Some are short-lived, but it's really interesting to capture their perspective and how genuine they are in naming their experiences out there and, and putting out there and just listening to that. I think there's a lesson and I think that there's value even for you know, uh, seasoned administrators or campus leaders to listen to those voices in those spaces because it's as real and as authentic as you can get. And oftentimes they may be coming from a personal, from maybe from their social identity. It may be coming from a very specific angle or a connection to an, a different um, like um, cultural topic or social topic of some sort. But, the reality is that these are the true experiences and perspectives of, of many folks in our field, and they're out there. Um, I can think of several people on my my staff who have their own podcast, um, and it's really fascinating to to see and hear some of their um, the things they talk about. Yeah, I think you know the the activist in me is is like this. This has been going on for so long, right? We have. It did not start with Trump, right? And it's not gonna end with, with Trump at all. But I think what we have to understand is that, you know, behind sort of naming systemic racism, there has to be action. There has to be sort of a shift in, in priorities and a transformation that happens at our institutions um, to really delve into um, beyond the rhetoric 
beyond, yes, we can be an anti-racist institution, but that requires some very, like some hard work, some hard conversations and um, some that, that has to not be on the shoulders of, you know, people of color either, right? That has to, you know, be sort of, um, you know, it has to be taken on that burden has to be taken on by senior leadership. And, you know, it's, so for me, it's, it's, it's great that we, yeah, we, you know, we're naming that, yeah, systemic racism is there and that we have seen it, you know, in terms of the disparities and ways that which the Black Lives Matter uh, movement has been treated, um, you know, back in August compared to, you know, what happened yesterday. Um, but it's been there. It's, you know, and so for me, it's, it's about like, you can't sort of, um, it can't just stay at the rhetoric. It has to go into sort of systemic change and action, which really, you know, for institutions of higher education is looking at our resource allocation and thinking about how do we redistribute resources and, and to really make this an equitable and uh, equity-minded centered system within higher education. I'll go one step further um, to, with that. I like that thought because I think that, yes, I think that's even maybe the challenge with podcasts. I think podcasts is a great way to create awareness. I think um, campus leaders can make statements, bold statements, right? But, but hearing things, maybe reading things, maybe listening things on podcasts, they give you the ideas, but how does it actually mm -hmm. happen, right? And if we think about that, that's where oftentimes we get stuck because student affairs professionals, they're getting the awareness and they're getting the knowledge, but not necessarily knowing how to maneuver their campus or the campus dynamics to create sustainable long-term change because they're, they're, they can potentially just be a cog in this larger very immobile um, system. And I think that's where it gets really fascinating for me because I think podcast allows, we were just talking about this. It would be really fascinating to take a look at some uh, colleges and universities who have really innovated in the last, let's say five years. Like mm -hmm. what happened at those institutions that allowed them to make changes like that? Because if they're, if they're willing to innovate, you know, it takes not just ideas, it takes decision makers to say, I'm willing to be uh, taking the risk to try something different and try something new. And I think that's what would be very fascinating for our field in general, because, you know, technically we're so stuck in our job where it's 40 plus hours sometimes a week, you know, and it's very difficult to know what's going on around us at other institutions, unless we're going to a conference, you know, that, that week at a time, or, you know, if you get an, if you're now able to get a, an online um, webinar or something like that, it's, it's limited. And even when you get that knowledge, again, can you find the time to really create change and you need critical mass? That's hard. I think that's the one gift of having to shift so much of our operations into a different format is we've had to really rethink, well, why do we do that? Should we keep doing that? Is that actually helpful right now? Um, you know, is this function something that can be accomplished virtually? Is it not? And you know, I know not everyone's institution went to virtual instruction, um, but we, we did. And we uh, will continue to be in virtual instruction primarily for the spring semester as well. Uh, and so we're having to even innovate things like starting to think about the sophomore experience, which has not ever really been an intentional mm -hmm. design experience like the first year student experience. But we're gonna have, you know, potentially 10, 12,000 Cougs who had never been to campus that could be in their first or second year. And that's a different way of approaching retention and enrollment management and crafting a class and all of these things that you know our, our partners on the EM side think about. So it's just been a really fun way to flex forward thinking a little bit. because we, we don't get to sit down and do that a whole lot. I think sometimes we're, um, we're so very much responding to the moment because the moment changes um, and mm -hmm. it happens. For sure. No, it was just that it just made me think about that. You know, I, I have a college kid and so she's actually taking a break um, next semester. And one of the things that I've been thinking about, it was like, wouldn't it be great if she's just kind of had some sort of contact to write, you know, she's planning to go back, but it's sort of like the online stuff wasn't working. And so she's gonna, um, and so thinking about like, you know, 
like the reframing and reshifting, it's like, okay, for those that have maybe stopped out, you know, until they're able to go fully on back on face to face, what are we doing for those, you know, students that continually want to be engaging in, in with their institution, but um, don't necessarily want to physically be there um, to take on on classes. And so, so yeah, so I think I'm, I'm always thinking about different ways to sort of, um, you know, to meet the demands, but, but I, I hope that we are, one thing that I know has come to my mind is the mental health of our students. And um, how do we rev up that capacity? How do we build more capacity? How do we shift the capacity um, to really meet the needs of our, of our students and their mental health? Because like I said, this, I think we're going to be seeing sort of like fragments and remnants of this for, for long, the, the long haul. Well, that's another interesting thing, I think, about podcasting and its intersection with mental health. So um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm subscribed to just more than 100 podcasts and uh, <laughs> ads right now are all telehealth, mental health uh, that are for uh, profit ads in the podcast space. And I, I don't have any personal experience with uh, virtual telehealth in that, in that way from mental health. I'm more of a traditionalist, um, but I wonder how that's going to shift the landscape of how students want their mental health services delivered or how they want mm. that interaction with that counselor delivered. Um, you know, what is the quality level of, of how that's happening? How does licensure get impacted by having your counselor be virtual? And just some of the things that um, we haven't caught up to, but every time I turn on a podcast, especially from a couple of the bigger podcast networks, it's like, you know, XYZ mental health is available and you can do it free right from your phone. Um, and so it's just, it's, interesting to look at mental health as a consumable product uh, rather than mm. uh, the health of our being. So it's, it's kind of co-opting and capitalizing mental health, um, which is what we do to a lot of different things. But I think it's uh, it has the potential to transition that field too, which will be fascinating to see. For sure. Yes, much needed on college campuses. I know that on, on our campus, very impacted, right? And I, I guess my biggest concern is because of the impacts, um, how much of some of that support and that that um, you know relief is is being put upon the staff, right? It's not their job to do that, but they're becoming that because how can how can you say no when a student has needs, right? And and we're in this really unique environment where it's just difficult to go out and 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 connect potentially with others who can support them, you know, and maybe their their support spaces, but um, but you might have the ability to connect with your RA or your advisor or someone mm -hmm. on Zoom. And, mm -hmm. um, and not to say that's um, a bad thing, but at the same time, you know, we, we recognize that there's, there's a reason why we have mental health professionals and they're experts in their chosen field and we wanna connect our students to them. But yes, the concern is how do we do that in this COVID environment and quite frankly, post COVID. Um, I think that's gonna be really fascinating because even though let's say we, the vaccine occurs and, and, and we're good to go, we are going to see the fallout from from 2020 and 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 now right now um in the future for years to come absolutely it's just uh like i said such an interesting thing for me to think about we're marking this conversation in time again in january of 2021 and what will it mean for someone to uh you know dig this out of the youtube hole in 2025 <laughs> uh or you know if youtube exists in 2030 you know just interesting things for uh to think about the fact that you know the future student affairs professionals that you both are mentoring or that we i guess all three of us are mentoring may look back and say wow they had absolutely no idea what they were talking about um or they could say wow um there are some nuggets in there and, and we just don't know what they'll be yet yeah That's awesome. jill i'm impressed 100 podcasts right yeah, something like that. I, I, I'll come in and come out of them. So I'll subscribe to something because I heard in, you know, teaser for it, something else. And uh, then it'll sit there for a while. Um, and I'll come back to it in a couple of years, maybe. But I just, wow. I'm kind of a non-deleter of them because sometimes I think maybe I'll get entertained by that one day. But that was also really reflective of uh, when I was spending a lot of time on planes and in airports um, in, mm. in the era where we were traveling more. But, you know, it, it actually just even kind of speaks to the fact that, you know, you know, I think about my podcast, like what's on my library, and it, it's it's across the board. It's not all like higher ed, right? And so we're we're getting this education from different 
fields, I guess, different just avenues and venues and just informing us. And I can only imagine what um, this generation, this next generation professionals who podcast is just their thing and they just want to be on it all the time. So they're being informed with so many different thought leaders, not just even in higher ed, but just everywhere else. And I just, I can only like just be optimistic that they're going to be, bring a different optic of different lens into um, uh, these leadership roles in the future. So yeah, podcast, I think it's a good thing. I, I just want to say that I even have my students make a podcast in my research methodology class. So they have to take one of the research paradigms and make a podcast about it. They can invite guests, they can, you know, question each other. So it's it's super entertaining to to read and or to to listen to, but um, they get very creative and they get very funny and um uh, you know, around the podcast and the production of it and it stays and so that's so awesome that they get this podcast that they can uh, access about they want to learn about you know refresh themselves on phenomenology they have a podcast totally devoted to it that's a really awesome assignment uh, and cool. what a really great way to have folks actually kind of teach and think and make mistakes and recover and you know just mm -hmm. that's wonderful I wish I would have had a something like that when I was a grad student that is awesome. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's pretty cool. It, <laughs> they, it's so funny. It's because I'll like do commercials in it. They're like, shout out to Dr. M and the higher ed program. And it's so funny. <laughs> oh, you invent a fake student affairs product to go in there. I love it. There you go. There you go. Well, at SA Voices, uh, as we end our shows, we like to engage our guests in a lightning round. Um, so I'm hoping you'll be willing to play. Yeah. Sure. Let's do it. All right. Uh, so we have seven questions to answer in about 90 seconds. So I'm just going to ask you to, uh, to just pick one of you to go first each question. Okay. I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> For those who are, who are on the podcast, we did the uh, put your finger on your nose, and I believe Susana is going first now. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Question one, if you were a conference keynote speaker, what would your entrance music be? Oh, Selena, for sure. Selena, baila como la flor, yeah. Am I supposed to answer yeah. the question? Yeah. Oh good. my goodness. Oh, I thought it was like, we go back and forth. <laughs> entrance music for me, uh, oh my gosh, this is horrible. Um, I, I don't know the name of the song, but the Hulk Hogan entrance song in wrestling. The WWE one? <laughs> WWF, I'm that oh. old. Oh, before the, oh. the wildlife people said, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Number two, what did you want to be when you grew up when you were five years old? Oh, my gosh. I think uh, five years old. I was in Mexico. I was not thinking about what I wanted to grow up. I think I, I, I just wanted to be queen. I think that's what I wanted to do <laughs> is be queen. <laughs> I actually know the answer to this. My my parents bought me a used drum set because I wanted to be a drummer. So a drum a drummer. Do you still drum? Oh no, no. <laughs> Number three, who is your most influential professional mentor? Oh my gosh, that's so hard. To, um, so many most influential. Uh, Dr. Laura Rendon um, was the first um, Chicana professor that I had that really made me visualize myself in a faculty role. I'm gonna name three. Um, the person who got me into the field, Dr. Dina Moramba. Um, I think a person who helped me understand my identity and how I fit in the field and helped me with my imposter syndrome, Dr. Keith Miser, who has passed away. Mm -hmm. and, um, and much love to Dr. Linda Ahuna Hamill, who recently passed away as well, but she was really instrumental in developing me as a professional. Question four, who's your favorite author, personal or professional? Oh my gosh, author. I mean, like I use like Gloria on Sandua's, um, or, uh, um, the, uh, her work in um, Borderland Theory and um in my work and so that's a that's a text that I go back to a lot so I would say Gloria and Sandua. Dr. Susana Munoz. Oh <laughs> number Whatever. five what is your essential student affairs read? 
Oh my gosh. Um, right now it feels like it's um, emergency response. <laughs> any manual from any in emergency response manual and just looking at, um, my goodness, I don't even want to say it's a book. I think it's a lot of online stuff right now. Wow. I, yeah, I think it's, mine has evolved, you know, because the student development theory book has evolved, you know, and so um, the the new um, book around critical frames in student development theory by D.L. Stewart, uh, Susan Jones, and, um, oh, I, I, I uh, why am, am, am I, Abus, E. Abus, Elias, Elise, Elise Abus, I'm sorry, Elise. <laughs> no, you are. Oh, it's so Ohio close. State people. Yes. You're doing great. This lightning round thing is a I know, it's so and hard. It's like, it's, it's like blanks right now, like what? <laughs> but I promise you know the answer to all of the questions. Um, <laughs> number six, the podcast that you personally spent the most hours listening to in the last year. Mm. Student affairs now, now. Now I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, believe it or not, this is this is and this is true because I just need to sometimes disconnect. I've been listening to the Office Ladies this past year. Oh, I um, love them. <laughs> I just laugh and laugh and laugh, and and it's it's it definitely helps. <laughs> so I would say Latinx intelligentsia. Give a shout out to my sister scholar, Dr. Michelle Espino. So I've been that uh, consuming that podcast um, all year. So if you haven't checked that out, check it out. It's awesome. Can you repeat the title, Susana? Latinx, Latinx Intelligentsia. All right. And finally, last question. Any shout outs you'd like to give personal or professional? Oh my gosh. Personal and professional. I would like to give a shout out to my kids who have been patient through this whole pandemic. I mean, we have painted, we have baked, we have done everything in terms of trying to entertain ourselves. So yes, I, I think shout out to, to my children, but, um, but also shout out to my graduate students who have really kept all of this, just um, provided so much joy in my life. So my grad students are amazing. Uh, shout out to my family and shout out to uh, my staff in residential life. Um, you know, this past week I was um, the administrator on call um, because obviously I'm in residential life and I got to work on the ground because everyone was sort of off um, in our isolation quarantine spaces. And I just want to send love to not only them, but all folks who are particularly working on responding to the, uh, the COVID uh, crisis and who have to work in spaces where, you know, they're putting themselves at harm uh, ways. So much love to them. You made it through the lightning round. Yay. <laughs> you did great. Do we win something? Anybody ever done the lightning <laughs> round to you? No, but I know my own questions. So for <laughs> half of them, I'm not really sure how I'd answer. <laughs> Susanna, that's a future podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I think my keynote entrance song changes pretty much daily. Um, and then I think I, I think I have the rest of them fairly on lock, but I think about that a lot sometimes, you know, when you just, your mind just way like, what would my <laughs> mm. <laughs> We've got some good songs. I feel like we need to make a Spotify playlist of everyone's entrance music and kind of, you know, put that, that is, out there. That there you go. Love it. There you go. I love that. <laughs> uh, well, if folks would like to reach either of you after the show airs, how can they find you? Uh, <laughs> They can email me at susana.munoz at colo state.edu. Um, probably the best way is email at gdg at berkeley.edu, or you can find me on Twitter at glenuckle. So that's G L E N N A K O. I'm going to have to follow you now. I'll do that after. <laughs> we, we I'm on there. Twitter. Yes. My, my handle is uh, susana phd, I think. It is. Right. <laughs> I love that Glenn knows your Twitter. <laughs> yes, I was like, <laughs> yeah. yes. Excellent. 
Uh, well, thank you so much for sharing your voices with the NASPA world this week. Uh, I'm really excited for the listeners to be able to have a bit of a different experience. And again, uh, you can watch this or you can listen to us as you normally do. Uh, this is our last episode of season three, Leadership at All Levels, and we will be back with new episodes. Uh, actually, I'm not quite sure when. We're envisioning season four right now, but uh, we try not to be away for too long. Well, at least from our side, um, we just definitely want to give a shout out to you, Jill. Thanks for um, yeah. coordinating and, and, and doing this crossover with Student Affairs Now, and shout My out to your, to your audience. Um, we hope that you kind of check out our um, Student Affairs Now um, space, and that's uh, studentaffairsnow.com. Am I right? Yes, I'm right. <laughs> Just mm -hmm. double checking. Mm -hmm. And you can subscribe to our newsletter as well. So that's probably the best way to find out about the things we're going to be talking about, the latest and advanced information. And then um, aside from that, this was fun. Your website is on point. Uh, that's how I found you all because uh, I, you know, from the transition from the previous iteration of your show to, to now, I went to your website. I was like, wow, you all are super organized. We got to get it together. And that's a shout out to uh, Heather Shea. Heather Shea. Heather yep. Shea. So love we're giving her girl. love right yep. here. Yep. <laughs> well, I Follow hope you both take care of yourselves in the coming Thanks. days. And, uh, you know, there's a lot ahead, but. Um, we got this, right? We got this. Yes, we do, yes. Jill. We do. It's a and, pleasure. Uh, be safe up in Pullman. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Take care. <laughs>